suppose I want you to get your opinion on and your feedback on. There are two big issues that I think are, are of interest. One is that since you became minister, it does appear as though there's a more positive attitude towards municipalities, um, which I'm quite certain is not coincidental. <laughs> but there's also, a, there, there seems to be sort of almost a reversal of policy in terms of traditionally, and even in the previous government, there were these cuts, especially to the municipal uh, partnership fund. Mm -hmm. And I know that this municipality, maybe two or three years ago, were basically expecting the thing to run out to be gone. Yeah. Yeah. But your government is, has kept it on. Yep, we sure have. And what's the thinking there? Well, the, the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund originally started as uh, a fund to help uh, small, rural, and northern municipalities um, deal with some of the issues facing them. Um, and over time, there became a number of components added to the OMPF. It ended up being a four, or sometimes you can argue it's a five-part program. Um, and you have situations where there are municipalities that are large urban municipalities that are getting significant uh, OMPF uh, dollars. So we decided rather than phasing out the fund, which as you so rightly acknowledge that the previous government had started, um, we decided to, to have a consultation with municipal officials about retargeting that fund at its, its original intention. Um, so this year, um, the other thing we did was we, because of some of the other issues around municipalities, we decided to give them some certainty. So for the very first time in August, last August, uh, it was announced uh, at the AMO conference where a significant amount of municipal officials were, what the figure would be for the, for the next year. So there was some certainty uh, so that when municipal budgets were, were started in the fall, that this wouldn't be an unknown component that the government would unveil sometime right around the first uh, the, the end of the last quarter of, uh, of uh, the next year. And then the other thing we decided to do this year at Roma, which just happened uh, a couple of weeks ago in uh, Toronto, um, was we wanted to communicate to them that we've retained the dollars for uh, the next budget, but that we would be sitting down with municipalities about uh, about how important the fund is. So, so yes, uh, there is a different approach when it comes to that particular fund. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, other measures that we've done as a government, the municipal modernization fund that we started for the 405 small rural and northern municipalities, and, but also the audit and accountability fund that we started for the 39 large urban municipalities. It's all about um, a partnership, but but with a, with a lens, certainly with the last two programs, about municipalities being more efficient and, and more effective. So there's definitely um, a, a municipal lens that's put on um, some of those funds. And I think the Premier's uh, announcement at Roma in his speech that this budget should be a no surprises budget uh, really was a relief um, by um, Ontario's 444 municipalities. Just given some of the speed that we moved as a government in the first year and the fact that there were a number of of uh, decisions made by certain ministries that had significant municipal consequences and we had to press the pause button on three and uh, sit down and, and really really talk to them about what, what's important and what's a priority for them. Hmm. As you probably know, this municipality has decided to do a, a four-year budget. Yes. Which seems to be a, a really positive step forward. Um, and the idea obviously being that but by the time of the next council coming in, there will still be a year left on this, and therefore they won't have to jump straight into budget activities. Is it likely that your government would be able to kind of parallel that so that when they're coming up with a four-year budget, they will know that there's going to be stable funding, or is this what you hope will come out of No, I, th I think, I think it, 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 partially that's correct. You know, when I was a mayor back in the 80s, we would sit down in our first year. It was a three-year term granted. And we would lay out a plan for the three-year term, uh, including capital expenditures and, and a guide on how we would handle the operating budget for the three years. Obviously, if things changed, we'd have to modify it. And I think most municipalities are now going back to that. There, there was a time in a four-year term where it was felt by some 
that just by simply having four years, you could you could have an ability to plan for a year or a year and a half and then mm-hmm. implement uh, in the last two and two and a half. But some municipalities didn't do that. Uh, but I do think that having a, a council do as North Grenville has done with a four-year budget or at least a four-year plan, it does provide some certainty, and it then gives them the opportunity to access provincial funds or uh, be able to put their plan in place. And I think that's that's what that was one of the original intents about uh, about creating a four-year municipal term. Mm-hmm. You know, I can remember where there was a time when I was a, a teenager where it was a one-year term. Yeah. And it just seemed like you were in this perpetual election cycle. Then the government of the day moved to two. My first year as a mayor back in uh, the early 80s was a three. And then there was a period of time uh, some time ago where uh, the province dealt with a four-year term. So I do think it's, it's, it's the right way to go. And it does give, certainly in a municipality like North Grenville that's fast-growing, that has many capital requirements, it gives them the opportunity for the council to focus on planning and then implementation. So it is, it is good. Mm-hmm. There it seems to be um, maybe more correspondence, more communication between um, your department and municipalities now compared to before. There was, was a fear, though, when a Conservative government came into power that it would lead to more, not just cutbacks, but uh, downloading mm-hmm. of services and mm-hmm. extra costs to municipalities and so on. Is there a different ideology, in a sense, involved now in terms of partners, partnering with municipalities yeah. rather than just dumping things on them. Yeah, no, there is. I think I think it's a. It, I, I think we've 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 presented a, a significant plan to municipalities that it won't be a top-down approach. That municipalities are really have to sit down and decide what is their future in terms of service delivery, governance, decision making, r- uh, relationship with their their neighbors or their upper tier uh, municipalities. Um, there was a fear, especially when we started the regional government review, that it, that we, it was just an exercise um, for for uh, amalgamations, mm. uh, and that was that was troubling to me because anybody who knew me knew that that wasn't something that I personally thought uh, was uh, the way to go. But I I picked a, 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 a consultation track where I wasn't going to insert myself into the process, which some of my friends acknowledged that must have driven me crazy that I couldn't <laughs> jump in and, and try to lead the discussion. But we wanted we wanted it to be led by uh, municipalities. We wanted it to be led by those councils and those staff to tell us what they felt um, they should do. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I was proud at the Roma conference was to announce that the next round of our municipal modernization fund were only to joint applications. There was 27 joint applications, including some in... Uh, in my own writing, uh, I didn't know that at the time, but uh, I, I picked up an approach to say anyone who who has got a willing dance partner that wants to look at a particular part of their operation with a view to make it more efficient, um, we're, we're going to approve it. We're going to actually fast track it. So, so I think people know, now know what I meant by um, the regional government review that it wasn't just to create. Um, you know, less municipalities and less council. It really is to provide that better service. When I was a president of AMO back in 1989, uh, there were 839 municipalities. Now there's 444, and there was this real fear that this exercise was only targeted at trying to reduce that 444 number, and that that is certainly not the case. And I think we've demonstrated in the last six months that uh, we really want people to go back and look at how they deliver services to taxpayers, realizing that there is only one taxpayer, and if, if there's an opportunity to deliver something better, um, then they should look at it. And I think, you know, in, in North Grenville's case, uh, they've, uh, they've, I think they, they're using their term to lay out a particular plan on how local committees work, how their staff relates to the public, and, you know, that's, uh, that's something that a lot of municipalities go through in a, in a mm-hmm. four-year term. But given that, you know, like in the United Counties, there are municipalities that we'll find, as we go in the future, they'll find it increasingly difficult to survive economically. They simply, they don't have the economic base or the, the tax base to survive. Is, in that case, is, is something like amalgamation inevitable or desirable for small rural municipalities? Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I guess I would answer that, that it's up to those municipalities. There are some that have come to me uh, at meetings like AMO and, and Roma and said that they're, they're concerned about, uh, about their future. I have others who have been in serious financial um, crisis 
and who have decided to adopt a pay-as-you-go um, um, you know, mantra moving forward. And I think everyone acknowledges that that's probably the the best uh, way to way to handle their finances. You know, there there will be some. I, I wouldn't subscribe that it, it, it one size fits all. Mm. I think there you have to realize that there are some small municipalities that might have a, a small population, but they might have a significant tax base for whatever reason. And there are some communities like like the one we're in today that have seen tremendous growth and and tremendous change over the last uh, decade and. Mm. You know, I still think the next 10 years we'll see, you know, significant growth and significant change here in North Granville again. And that, again, has its own unique challenges on a municipality because, um, you know, they, they have to subscribe to growth pays for growth, but they also have to acknowledge that they're going to need some help from the upper uh, levels of government mm -hmm. if they're going to be sustainable. And, you know, you look at projects like 43, yeah. Um, you know, if you didn't have those contributions by the province and the federal government, you know, the municipality and the county would have been unable to finance that through their own mm -hmm. their own means. And uh, you know, that's that to me is a good example of a of a municipality deciding and prioritizing what's what's the most important project for their community. And and there have been times in the past where municipalities have thrown out three or four projects and allowed the province to pick. You know, sometimes the province. Uh, won't pick the right program because they need that direction from that local council. And you know what we've tried to do, we've tried to be open, we've tried to be accessible, uh, we've tried to be able to uh, consult. In fact, at one point, <coughs> excuse me, Amos said, you know, we're probably consulting too much. There's too many projects and too many ministries out there asking for our advice. And it's, again, it's a capacity issue. You've got, for the most part, uh, municipalities that are... Uh, people that are part-time counselors so they have to rely on uh, on their staff but I I don't subscribe to uh, to, to um, amalgamations I don't think that that's that's always the answer mm -hmm. and if it is it, it should come from the local community well you can see even in North Grenville I mean almost 25 years after amalgamation there's still very much a separate identity yep. almost in the three partners and and still a lot of sort of angst in yeah. Oxford and Rideau in particular, outside yeah. of Kempo. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, and, you know it, it, that's, that, that's no different than any other corner. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even some of the regional governments, um, you know, that have, been, that have been here since the 70s, you know, even after 50 years, you still have that concern about the loss of identity. I, you know, I heard it when I was in the University of Waterloo about Galt and Paris and Hespler, you know, having lost their identity. And th those still comments came out during the regional government review uh, and that's a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, but it's still, it's still, um, you know, they, they want to have some municipal services for the dollars that they they pay uh, to the municipality, and that's no different whether you're in Oxford on Rideau or you know anywhere else in uh, in in the counties. It's uh, you know people want to make sure that the municipality doesn't forget any corner of their municipality, and it's a t it's a tough pressure for the local council. Yeah, it comes out in interesting ways here because I find there are people who. When they're talking about North Grenville, we'll say Kempville. And that gets some other people really annoyed. Oh, yeah. oh, Kempville, it's North Grenville. And even then, uh, a lot of articles have come into the paper recently uh, talking about the river. Is it the South Branch or is it Kempville Creek? <laughs> uh, and people get really involved in yeah. that. You know, it's the Kempville Creek. It was Kempville Creek when I was growing up and it always yeah, will be. And that's think, right. Well, South Branch is the original name and it's you know on the map anyway. But that kind of a small thing like that can really become an issue for people. For sure, yeah. for sure. absolutely. I was actually watching your um, your presentation at at Roma, mm -hmm. and I was thinking that's a very different speech than you would have given before you were a minister, obviously, because this is very much like here's what we're doing for you and here's what we're giving yep. you, and you know it's, it's very much a political thing that way. I was wondering how that affects you as a minister and as a member for this riding. How do you see the province, or how do you see municipalities differently now that you have responsibility for 444 of them? Well, yeah, and, and you know, we, we were talking in the car, uh, Michael and I, on the way up, and, you know, I, I've, I think I've toured probably 86 uh, ridings uh, in the last year. I just, you know, yeah, Friday I did a speech uh, for the Western Wardens Caucus in, uh, in Ingersoll, and then at night I was at a... Uh, 
fireworks display at the start of Frostfest in Sealy's Bay. So it, you know, the, the one thing yeah. you realize is the province is large, and the issues, um, you know, while some are common, there are some that are um, different to the areas uh, in in, uh, in Ontario. The northern communities, you know, last year I uh, attended northern conferences in uh, Thunder Bay and Sudbury. This year they're in Timmins and Fort Francis. And, you, you know, you travel to Fort Francis. Uh, you know, first of all, when you talk to Minister Rickford, you're flying into, you know, International Falls, Minnesota, uh, you know, that which, which is a bit of a difference. Same mm -hmm. thing when I toured Kenora last January. You know, we flew into Winnipeg, uh, which yeah. was the easier, easier drive. You know the province is huge, and mm -hmm. and the the issues in even the north versus the you know the northeast and the northwest are significantly different. The issues, while there might be some common issues between the southwest and the the east, you know there are different issues for different communities, and and it does does give me an appreciation like it did back when I was a mayor and and was involved with AMO uh, at the association. It does give you a. a um, a very good perspective of some of the challenges. It's also interesting the way AMO is set up now. Uh, we meet with them every month, and every section of AMO is represented. So you've got the two northern associations, you've got staff at the table, you've got the small urban uh, caucus, the rural caucus, the large urban caucus, uh, the uh, mayor's uh, regional government. So you've got you've got all these different voices at the table. And I just find it fascinating when we're in a confidential uh, consultation just to hear some of the different challenges between big cities and small towns. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it is, a, it is a real balancing act because, you know, as you said, you know, compared to my riding, it's a predominantly rural riding. You know, when you've got a, a hundred, little over 100,000 people in, in your urban center is, you know, you can argue Brockville at 24,000. You can argue that, you know, North Grenville... Uh, parts of North Grenville because of the close proximity of Ottawa. But other than that, you've got a very, very rural riding. Some of the challenges that we face, um, you know, are, are predominantly because of the, the size and the, and the lack of population density. Um, so there are some unique challenges, and you do have to balance it as a, as a minister and a member uh, to ensure that uh, your riding's um, priorities are the government's priorities. And that's why it's so important to have councils prioritize what is the most important projects in their community because it is in a challenging fiscal environment you really need to lean on those councils mm -hmm. to say you know your priorities are are my priorities and then i have to you know stick handle them through uh around the cabinet table and around treasury board which you know uh, I, I think i've 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 done okay to have 16 ministers here in the first uh, little over a year and i have 60 government related announcements you know, we've tried to we've tried to deliver uh, our share, which is what I've said. You know, the whole time I've been an MPP is that mm -hmm. you know my people pay taxes just like everybody else, and they deserve their fair share of uh, of services. And yeah. I'm going to continue to uh, to preach that. I I have actually wondered about that because in my other work, I travel a lot in the north and to Indian reserves all mm -hmm. over the place, and I lived in Thunder Bay for a few years, and I'm really aware of how completely different parts of the, the province can be and how difficult it must be then for one department, as it were, to sort of find policies that are adaptable and flexible enough to, to be applied in those different places. The other thing I was wondering about, though, is I remember before you were a member of the government, people were constantly amazed at just how much travel you had to do around your own writing mm -hmm. because of so much that was going on. Now you're traveling around the province. I mean, that must make a huge difference in terms of just your workload and how you allocate your time. Yeah, it, it, it does, you know, the, especially when the House is sitting. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm, I have other duties on cabinet committees, uh, you know, uh, so it is, a, it is a real, you know, I thought it was hard to schedule uh, before I was in government, mm -hmm. and it is, uh, you know, we have to really lean on my staff in the constituency office, and I've got great staff both in the constituency office and in the ministry, and they work very well together, mm -hmm. making sure each other know where I am and, and when I'll be at each uh, each office. Um, but it does. It, it's a it's a because of the ministry, the fact that we have such a high priority with the with the government. There's been so many municipal related uh, initiatives. You know, the housing supply action plan, the community housing renewal strategy. Uh, the, you know, there there are a number of things that we're working on. 
that impact municipalities, something as simple as aligning our fiscal years, which we're mm -hmm. always out of sync and part of, I think, the challenge in dealing with municipalities were the fact that we were, uh, we were on a fiscal year and they were on a calendar year. So even something that small, that takes a long time to consult and to uh, uh, appreciate the, the challenges that a small municipality has in, in, in adhering to that policy item. So it's a, you know, it is a, it is a balancing act, no mm -hmm. issues, no question. Yeah, I was also intrigued by the fact that it sort of first out of the box as you become minister is the whole Toronto issue and the size of council and all that kind of stuff. It's like being, you're definitely thrown in at the deep end in those things. Right? Yeah, you know, and, and somebody asked me about that. You know, remember the media said, you know, when was the first time you heard about that? And it was actually the first time I had met uh, Premier Ford uh, when he was with his brother, who was then Mayor Ford. And mm -hmm. it was the very first time I met them. I think it was 2011 at Chief Bill Blair's uh, uh, fundraiser for Victim Services Toronto. And mm -hmm. they indicated that they'd like to reduce the council size. So it was a priority that the government had worked on before I was sworn in, our, our government, sort of in that transition period, and then we jumped in and, and tabled the bill and got it passed, and it's still, <coughs> still being argued before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it, was a, it was something that uh, uh, got me on my feet uh, for question period quite often, and then we just moved into a number of major policy areas, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, the, as I said earlier, the Housing Supply Action Plan, and the community housing renewal strategy, and then we're just finishing up uh, the provincial policy statement. So we've we've carried a significant load of policy um, for the government so far, you know, fairly early in the mandate. You know, we're not even at the halfway point, and uh, we've got a number of measures that uh, we're working on that will be either announced or tabled um, this spring. So it's, uh, we're still we're still carrying a significant amount of weight for the government, mm -hmm. which is which is great. I think it's it's great to put municipalities and housing uh, at the forefront. I, I can't think of a time in my um, political life uh, at any level of government where we've had all three levels of government talking about the importance of housing. Um, and I think, you know, we're, you know, our goal is to leverage every municipal and federal dollar along with what we're spending provincially. And uh, I'm excited about some of the opportunities that we've got for uh, on the housing file. And I think it's a... Uh, it's a real uh, great priority for the government to be talking about, um, you know, building up communities and, and having more home ownership and providing more options for people to live uh, in communities. And, and, and we've had some great ideas. Uh, f uh, you know, you mentioned some of the Indigenous communities. You know, one of my best announcements was just before Christmas. I was up in Sault Ste. Marie and we signed a, a renewal deal uh, with Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services. And it was something that I heard about, I think, the first or second week I was minister hmm. and uh, was pretty proud when we were able to sign the deal. It uh, it will make a big impact right across the province by partnering with uh, that not-for-profit uh, yeah. who have significant holdings in communities right across the province, but opportunities for us to renew. And uh, it was a great great ceremony. It was one of the highlights of my uh, my 2019 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just finished a, a paper on housing, basically the history of unreserved housing, especially in Ontario, uh, for the Anishinaabeg Nation, yeah. and, and it was sh <coughs> really shocking to realize just how bad the situation was on so many reserves, especially in, in the kind of more remote areas, and the, uh, the resulting health crises that take, take place where people are just dying of tuberculosis in the, right up in the 60s and 70s. And yeah, it, it's overwhelming at times to think of yeah. bringing everything up to well, standard again. And, 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 you know, the federal government has the majority of responsibility mm -hmm. on reserve, but what we're finding is with groups like Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services is we, we deal with them for the tremendous uh, amount of, uh, of people that are living off reserve in, in communities. And we're, we've seen it, uh, I've seen it firsthand, and uh, you need to have a partner like, uh, like them who will work with a service manager or uh, the private sector to either build or renovate uh, either new units or renovate some of the existing units. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I knocked on doors uh, for some of my past elections, and I've knocked on uh, doors in the riding that were Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services, and I had no idea that it was a mm -hmm. provincial agency or a provincial partner until we became government. It was a, 
a group that I had had limited to none uh, contact with, uh, and now you know it's it's one of the big success stories I've I've had in a short period of time to be able to renegotiate and put a plan in place to uh, to build more units uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and help more people. It's a it was something that we uh, we took a long time to work with it. It was a it was a big negotiation. Mm-hmm. In terms of local housing and so on, obviously you'll know that there's the affordable housing yep. task force that reported recently and. Housing generally, the cost of housing is is a major issue, of course, everywhere. One of the issues I've been wondering about, though, was I talked to some local builders, Mm -hmm. and they feel that it's almost impossible for them to build a house that is affordable Mm -hmm. under those kind of criteria, simply because of the amount of tax they pay on materials and how difficult it is and labor costs and all this kind of stuff. How can government work with builders in that way? What is happening in that regard? Yeah, there's a lot of things happening in that way. Part, part of the, the community housing renewal strategy from uh, you know community housing units is to get service managers to look at a different way when some of their mortgage agreements end. Is that, you know, work with the private sector on renewing units. But in most cases, um, sorry, sorry, I shouldn't say most cases, in many cases, um, there are significant land holdings that the service manager would have through the county that could be leveraged as an asset to build more community housing. Um, and when you factor out the cost of uh, land, um, you can get the some of the unit uh, costs uh, down significantly. There's also partnerships with groups like Habitat that uh, obviously uh, here in North Granville, that's one of their active partnerships that they're working on as part of their task force. And Habitats have got a, a great model where they've been able to fundraise locally and, and partner um, to, to be able to get lower cost uh, construction, um, but at the same time work on a, a home or, a affordable home ownership piece. We, we've investigated lots of uh, great ideas. We've created four guides um, uh, this year, and we're talking about creating some more. So the four guides, um, some of the things that we've looked at are uh, tiny homes, which has been uh, something that there's a number of municipalities that wanted to um, investigate tiny homes but didn't know some of the, the challenges that, that they face, so we created a guide for that. Uh, we created a guide for cohabitation uh, because we had a case where uh, in Port Perry there were four women uh, nicknamed the Golden Girls that bought a home. They sold, they sold their four homes to four other people to create the home ownership opportunities for four other families. They bought a house, renovated it, and uh, made an agreement to... Uh, to live together and in a cohabitation a- arrangement, um, which was, uh, you know, I think very innovative. Um, life lease communities were something that people told us that they needed assistance with. Um, it fits for some folks, so we created a guide for that. And then just simply on the rental side, we created a guide to create second units in people's homes, so basement apartments, um, which, you know, will, will help with a loved one, perhaps a granny suite. Uh, or just uh, another rental income to help keep someone in their home. Um, that, in addition to some of the other pieces that we've worked on through the through the Housing Supply Action Plan, just trying to create more certainty in terms of community benefits uh, rather than the existing development charge regime. We've looked at our own provincial um, uh, approvals process and with a view of trying to streamline it because time is money. Uh, mm-hmm. The longer it takes to get an approval, the the more costs that add in the end to uh, to a housing development. And, you know, one of the things <clears throat> that I was told to do was to look at things, uh, look at measures that I could put in place as a province to incent the type of development that I wanted. So we wanted more purpose-built rental, so we decided to lift the rent control exemption on new units built and occupied after November 15th. And we've seen now, using CMHC's number, um, more purpose-built rentals started uh, last year than we've seen since 1992. Um, so we have we have seen some success. There's much more we can do. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about with the Municipal Modernization Fund is to actually go back and look at the applications of municipalities who wanted to streamline their own development approval process. And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get a, get a line of sight on how many municipalities think that's a priority for them. Uh, I think it's a, it should be a priority for them as part of building more homes. Mm. Um, and then the final thing that I think has some real impact uh, is to look at some of the available lands that the province owns. We own a significant uh, amount of holdings 
uh, and I think we need in a in a in a in an environment like we like we have where we want more affordable housing, where we want more long term care homes, that we should uh, look at all of the available land with a view of can we use that land to provide housing opportunities or long term care opportunities in communities based on their priorities. So you know there, th th that's a lot of things I've thrown mm -hmm. thrown up, uh, and there's a lot more things that we're looking at because the one thing that I've realized as the housing minister is even if I table a bill and it gets royal assent like it happened in June, nobody's going to sit there and pat me on the back that I've solved the housing supply crisis uh, yeah. because for every problem I solve, there's three more problems that pop up, and and that's the focus uh, of the ministry. So we're going to. We're going to, in this uh, session, hopefully, uh, if all goes well, have our second housing supply action plan bill that will deal with some of the new issues that we want to tackle as a ministry. Hmm. In terms of linking the, the two yep. portfolios as it were together, when you're talking about sort of second units or and that kind of thing, how does that impact on municipal zoning issues? Yeah, so 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 some of some of municipalities, what we try to do with the four guides, for example, mm -hmm. is get best practices. Is use best practices out there. There are some communities that have embraced tiny homes. There are some that have talked about it in committees or in their council chamber. Not really sure how they're not really sure how it connects to their local zoning bylaw or mm -hmm. local official plan. And what we've tried to do is try to use our municipal service offices. Uh, and some of the pieces that we've created for the ministry to help those municipalities guide them. So if, if North Granville, for example, their task force felt that some of the issues on tiny homes or, or cohabitation or creating second suites were a priority, they could use those guides as an opportunity for their staff to help recommend policies uh, to be implemented at the, around the council chamber. And, mm -hmm. and we've already seen um, uh, benefits from some of the past work that we did in 2019. So it's a it's always a step in process. It's always uh, it's not just legislation. There's also education that mm -hmm. has to take place, and uh, we've had a we've had a very good uptake by municipal officials and service managers so far to some of the changes that we've made. But there is more a lot more work we have to do. Mm -hmm. You can see a situation in North Granville where people are demanding more housing, but at the same time they don't want to put too much housing in the urban areas or the, the hamlets, but there's not enough space really in, in Kempville for that much more. What there is being put in then, the fear is that if we need a great deal of housing, then are we going to end up with subdivisions that are just concrete and yes. identical houses? Yeah. And So it, it's also a matter of how much flexibility builders have yes. and municipalities have in terms of zoning, density issues, yes. all that kind of stuff, and even design issues. Yeah, even design issues. And, and, we, and we heard a lot of very, very good innovative ideas as part of the Housing Supply Action Plan. It's just there was far too much to, to, for us to put in the first bill. That's why we've, we've, we've broken it up. Um, and, you know, and the issues are very complex, but we, mm. we, we are committed to doing some more of those uh, innovation guides to help municipalities. And, um, you know, I, I've... I've a week doesn't go by that I don't meet uh, a local councillor who wants housing to be one of the top priorities of the government. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier. You know, we, we're the first uh, province that have signed on with the federal government on a Canada-Ontario housing benefit, which really turns the whole model on its head. It's not building a unit, it's providing a benefit for a targeted person to be able to house them. Um, so it is a different, it, a different type of, uh, of help, and we're starting slow with the feds. Uh, we're probably going to help about 5,000 people in the first year, but we've targeted, uh, you know, a very specific demographic, you know, people that are fleeing domestic violence, human sex trafficking, um, you know, some of the most um, people who need the help the most, um, uh, who need something that isn't sitting on a wait list for, for a year. They need something that's more immediate, and we're hoping this portable housing benefit will help give people a hand up and get them transitioned into you know, a different, more stable type of, uh, of housing. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of things that are happening this year, um, but there's a lot of cooperation we've uh, received with the federal government. It's, uh, it's really unprecedented. I know now that the federal election is over and you know, we, we're, everybody's not posturing you know, who's against who, yeah. um, you know, because that, that's the one thing that I said at some of the New Year's levies is people are pretty tired of the three levels of government fighting. 
know, they, they, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't want to hear partisan uh, comments. They want to hear people rolling up their sleeves and actually getting stuff done. And housing is that one item that I think, um, you know, every political party has talked about doing more for uh, housing. And I think it's the one good idea that I think we can, at the end of the day, show people that we've actually built bridges, um, worked with the federal government, worked with our municipal partners, and actually got some results. And mm -hmm. that's that's the lens I look at it with. Yeah. Okay. The, one short thing. I know we're short of time now, but and I don't know if it's even relevant to your department, but I imagine it would be, and that's the whole issue of joint and several liability. Yep, absolutely, yeah. Um, Ontario seems to be in a really nasty situation in terms of how vulnerable municipalities are to insurance claims where they may not even be involved in the actual issue that I, I, I claim. Is there anything in the pipeline that will change that issue of joint and several liability well, and relieve yeah. municipalities? Well, I, well, I, I made a bet, uh, no, no money. Uh, but I just basically said to the Attorney General, you know, you will not get through a minister's forum session for an hour without having a question on joint and several liability. And when he got the question, he says, oh, yes, uh, Minister Clark won the bat because he knew I would get one. And, you know, especially small rural and northern municipalities, it's a real concern. Um, the Ministry of the Attorney General did do a consultation, and they really look at it in, in two, two buckets. One as an insurance uh, issue and one as a as a true joint and several liability issue. So, um, Minister Downey is going to be sitting down with uh, with AMO and reviewing some of the examples um, that he's received. But he's also, I think, rightly so, um, signaled that he wants to bring the insurance industry in, mm -hmm. and he wants them to be sitting at the table to try to deal with some of the the challenges. You know, the 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 for example, the no tobogganing rule versus you know, uh, an accident that took place at a municipal facility. So it's yeah. it's one where you know it's a municipal asset versus um, it's it's you know the municipality is tagged on as a as a as an extra person as part the of, deep a, pockets. of as a yes the yeah. deep pocket issue. So Minister Downey uh, has done the consultation. They're, they've looked at other models. You know, Amos looked at I believe it's the Saskatchewan model that that they've they've put forward as a as an alternative. So, you know, it is something that uh, that Minister Downey wants to look at. So I, I'm happy because there was, uh, it wasn't very long ago, Madeleine Mayer, who was the, the former Liberal Attorney General, mm -hmm. basically said at an AMO meeting, you know, we've talked to the trial lawyers and they said not to do this. And I have never saw a more angry mob of, uh, mm -hmm. of municipal officials than I saw at that meeting. Um, you know, it, we announced it a year ago at Roma that we would start the review. Um, and I'm glad Minister Downey has indicated now that we want to move from what we heard over the last year into some form of implementation. So I hope in the coming months he'll have a plan that he can at least lay out for um, cities and towns and townships across the province. That would be great. Yeah, it would be. Okay, well, I know you have to go, so I really, thanks for taking yeah. the time. No, no worries. No, this is okay. great. This is great. Thanks. Good All to see the you best. Again. Yeah, good seeing you too.